This is EPL Insights with data provided by InfoGoal for game week 31 of the Premier League season. Gareth Wheeler and Jake Osgathorpe with you with another week of bold predictions, some prognostication, and some laughs along the way. How you doing, Jake? Doing okay? Very good, yeah. Um, last weekend, okay from a tipping perspective, just made a profit. Um, but yeah, it was there was some really dodgy calls when they were just talking before starting to record there. The VAR definitely... Had a little bit of an impact in some of the plays, notably Brighton. I think we were both on Brighton plus naught on the handicap. Um, one one, and then a very obvious penalty, which wasn't given. Um, and then, and then the refereed association come out and apologize for it afterwards. It's like, no, it's too late. It's too late to apologize after. <laughs> They've lost the game, you know. Um, that could be the difference between Brighton finishing in the top six or top four. You never know. So yeah, that those kind of things just have to go down the bad beat column. That that was a loser for me. You're just hoping Pinnacle, can you refund? It doesn't work that way when there's <laughs> incorrect or, or or poor refereeing decisions. I, I'm actually friends with a lot of Spurs fans and people that are really invested in the club. They're like, I have no idea how we won that game. Like completely against it. Brentford and, and Ivan Tony a penalty miss. It just wasn't a great week. It, it's kind of funny. Like some of the plays that you kind of felt a little bit confident in, like leads crystal palace over i felt good about it but the way that that game played out emphatic and you come around to you know you puff out your chest a little bit and say you know what after some bad beats you do feel good about some things and and honestly the, the game of the weekend it was a brilliant match to watch especially for the neutral uh liverpool arsenal uh or uh, from from anfield liverpool are just one of the most watchable sides when they play at home and when they're away from home like they are this week who knows? Your, your, your guess is as good as mine. Anything else stand out to you about last week? Um, not just again, just how ominous things look from a Man City perspective. I know we're recording this on a Wednesday, so we've had the chance to watch them in the Champions League just dismantle what we thought was a decent Bayern Munich team, um, and they just seem to have hit that kind of gear that they always do at this time of the season, where they just churn out results, make it look easy score a lot of goals um, and you, you just you just have the feeling that they are going to close that gap again to us. Obviously, game in hand, game against them at, at the Etihad. Um, and yeah, it felt like a big weekend. So I know Arsenal, you know, before the game, 2-2 draw at Liverpool is not a bad result. But to go 2-0 up and then see that two-goal lead slip away and be hanging on for dear life seemed like a little bit of a... Um, a potential swing there because I think if that was Man City, for example, at Anfield, they go 2 0 up, you expect them to see that through. Um, yeah, so that that was potentially big for the title race. And, and I think I'm right in saying that City are now favourites in the future line. Uh, Ramsdale was, was great. And that's why that game was so big because City have a game in hand and they play one another. And in terms of goal differential, it's not really close, is it? So things are tipping in the favor of Manchester City. They are odds on in terms of the future plays at Pinnacle. Minus 133, Arsenal at plus 109. What do you make of that, Jake? Um, I think it's fair now. I, I thought, I, I kind of, it, it, it seemed weird to say before the match, but it did feel like a very big game, big statement, not only for the actual points, but for the, the mentality and the psyche of the Arsenal players um, and to land a blow mentally to Man City. If they'd gone to Liverpool and won, this is, this is a big statement victory. And, um, you know, that that they showed a lot of frailties, which I thought was a little bit worrying. They conceded over four and a half, nearly four and a half expected goals, which, again, is hugely concerning. We know what Liverpool are capable of playing at Anfield, but, you know, this is a team trying to chase down a title. You don't go anywhere and concede that amount of chances um, in any game, no matter who you're playing against. So that, that was hugely concerning. And it did just kind of emphasise to me just how important how important William Saliba is to that team right now because yeah. you take him out and you put Rob Holden in and, and there are quite a few cracks that do uh, appear. And, um, you know, you factor in as well the, it, I guess the, you could say naivety, just, just the lack of experience in these kind of situations, the pre like dealing with the pressure. They're a young team. They've not really been there, done that before. I know Arteta has obviously been on Pep staff and has experienced it, but I felt some of his substitutions were a little bit um, questionable. Going to a back five with 15 minutes left, you're just asking for trouble. Like you know, you you are in theory one of the best teams in the league, if not the best, right now. Like you should be taking the game to Liverpool, and and they just felt like they kind of um, were overcome with pressure, and it just felt like a matter of time. And I do fear for them. I think I still think mm. they'll push City close, but I do fear for them. 
um, and the way in which City are going about the business. The obviously they've got a stacked schedule compared to Arsenal. Arsenal have got a you know pretty much every week free, just one game a week. But City have got the squad to deal with that. And you know the, the Bernardo Silva has been coming off the bench recently. He was excellent against Bayern Munich um, to challenge Mares and. Yeah, I I think those prices are about fair now. And um you just kind of hope that they keep it close until the end of the season and that they don't completely fall away because then we would have no title race whatsoever. What do you think about that? Are you, are you uh, thinking of a an Arsenal play? I can't come around to do it. I, I think that just in terms of who's the better side, if you if you look at that, the run-ins to their season, I know that City are playing the Champions League, but this team looks fully equipped. And capable just in terms of quality and depth and uh, and 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 scoring prowess. I mean, the, the city team. I I wouldn't bet against them. I, I've been on their side uh, for weeks. They just needed to slip up like Arsenal did on the weekend. Arsenal win that. I felt that if Arsenal won that game at Anfield, that they were going to win the title. The fact that they did drop points, they opened up the door for Manchester City to do the job on Arsenal. Uh, just another couple quick points before we get into our feature five. And our rapid fire for this week, also on the futures market for relegation. I got on this right after Leicester City sacked Brendan Rodgers. But I think they're going to go beyond a point where they're bettable to be re relegated after this week. At minus 130 to get relegated, I still think there's some value. Leicester City, no team is in poorer form right now in the Premier League. They're going after Jesse Marsh. Jesse Marsh? Like right now for this, it's just insane to me. And they play Manchester City this week. So they're not going to come away with anything. I think this is the last time that that number will be anywhere close to bettable. Not sure if you have any thoughts on that. I think Leicester City are in some real trouble here, Jake. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, the, the appointment of Dean Smith is uninspiring to say the least. Um, you know, he got sacked by Norwich for what, what well, I've, Pre-season, I thought that Norwich should be almost shooing, given the squad to go up, and, and they've completely made a mess of that, and he's been a big part. Um, yeah, they, they, they it's not just the results, is it? It's the performances. And, um, you know, like the, the, the game last week against Bournemouth, I know they've got a caretaker manager in, but they were completely outplayed by a team that everyone thought pre-season were going to be relegated by this stage. And, um, you know, as I said last week, I've been banging this drum for a while now. Um, and I, I, good friends, Mark Taylor, who does some writing for Pinnacle, he put a good tweet up for the, um, the other day just saying, just highlighting that when Leicester finished eighth, their underlying process was the 18th best in the league. So they were still, they were a relegation team despite finishing eighth. And ultimately, regressions occurred. Nothing's changed. They've not improved the squad. Um, uh, and they've continued playing at the same level. And they've just got the, the results that, are expected from that level. Um, whereas previous seasons they'd overperformed. That's not happened this time around. And, and they've been dragged into a serious, serious struggle. And ultimately, unless they improve that level again, they are going to go down because they are performing like one of the no, relegation I teams. It. And I don't um, see it. I'm with you. I think the, the, the fixture list is pretty tough for them as well. Um, you know, they've got a couple of games against teams around them, which will obviously have pinpointed. But like you said, they've got City, they've got Liverpool, they've got Newcastle to play. Um which, yeah, it is tough. And what's the seven games left, eight games left for Leicester? They face a bit of an uphill battle, not just because they need points, but teams around them are picking points up as well. You know, it's not like everyone's sat still. Apart from Forest, everyone's like generally picking points up every week. So, yeah, um, I, I agree with you. I think this could be a bit of a struggle for them um, to get out of it, for sure. Uh, a reminder, also live betting, you can find some real gems on Pinnacle as well in games. Liverpool to draw at 2 0 down to Arsenal. Uh, it came through at one point at plus 940 on Pinnacle to draw just before Mo Salah scored, um, scored his goal. Another missed penalty for Mo Salah, by the way, just downright bizarre, not very good at all. Uh, and Newcastle to win when they're 1 0 down to Brentford. Um, it hit plus 577 just before Newcastle scored as well. So keep it locked in game to Pinnacle. And you might find some plays, uh, especially if you're watching these games, you're just not watching the scores, the way the games are playing out. Liverpool to come from behind. It, it, it seemed probable. Uh, same goes for Newcastle, Brentford as well. Are we ready to dig into this week's fixtures, Jake? Um, yeah. And let's try to rebound. You've made a small profit, me. Um, a rare poor performance from your boy wheels this week. So we'll get it back on track here. And we will. 
All right. I don't um, know, what, what did you think about when you just just from an overall slate perspective? Because I looked at the slate of fixtures and thought, oh, there's quite a lot of fans here. I've this got quite week? a few bets. Yeah. Compared, compared to the previous two weeks, yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I feel much more um, confident. And I think there might be only one game that I don't know to play for. We'll see. I might actually come around and, and, and make it 10 for 10 here this week. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, let's start off. It's two of the most informed teams in the Premier League, third in the form table against fourth in the form table. It's Aston Villa who are in sixth place, staring down potential European football. Is it too soon to jump on that trade? Perhaps not, as they take on third place Newcastle. Villa coming off a 2 0 victory over Nottingham Forest. Ollie Watkins, you said it before the season started, it just took a while for him to get going, Jake. But he scored nine goals in his last 11 games. Uh, Four wins in a row, no losses in seven for Villa. They've gone under the total of two and a half in five of seven and been the first to score in their last eight games. That is a recipe for success. They have three straight wins at home without conceding a goal. The only problem for them, really the only negative, Leon Bailey out with a hamstring injury. For Newcastle, a 2-1 hard-fought victory against Brentford. Uh, a 2.54 XG to 1.2 in that match. Uh, Alexander Isak, he's got the Ollie Watkins form right now, doesn't he? He scored five goals in his last five games. Five wins in a row for Newcastle. They've gone over the total of two and a half in four or five, and both teams to score have played in four or five. Three straight away wins as well. A 2-1, a 5-1, and a 2-1. So both teams to score have played in each and every one of those three games. St. Maximum, he is out hurt, frustrating because he was on some really good form. And Almiron remains out as well. Head-to-head, Newcastle smashed Aston Villa 4-0. Callum Wilson scored a brace in that game. The XG in that game, 4.27 to just 0.31 according to InfoGoal. But what you need to remember, it was the bridge match between Gerrard to Emery. So there's a caretaker manager in that for Aston Villa at that time. And they played a really informed Newcastle team at that time as well. In head to heads, they've gone under the two and a half total in nine of their last 10 meetings. So who do you like here, Jake? Two really enticing teams, a lot to like about the way that both sides are playing two good managers as well. Uh, Who do you like in this game? Um, If I was, going to take a team it would be Newcastle um to win and I, I just think that number's a little bit skinny for me at the moment plus 113 so I've, I've taken a look elsewhere for a bet um but yeah it's, it's kind of one of those like how did you get there Villa how did you manage to do that <laughs> you come from bottom half to European places uh which is pretty remarkable um but I'm not getting carried away because ultimately they've had a really good run they've six wins from seven but the, play, the teams they've played, barring Chelsea, are all from the relegation battle. So they've had a very kind schedule. And, you know, the, as good top half teams do, potential European contenders do, you know, you should beat those kind of teams. And they have done. Um, and they've done it fairly well. But this is the first time that they've played a genuine top four team. Because I, I think in my, in my books anyway, Newcastle are a top four team. The underlying data they've posted this season is sensational. Um, and this is the first time they're going to have faced a team of such ilk since they got absolutely smacked by Man City and Arsenal in back-to-back weeks. Uh, they conceded over three expected goals in both matches. Uh, and I just I just have that nagging doubt that that this is a bit of a step up from what they've played recently. And obviously, they've, they've gained so much confidence. They are clicking. They're playing better football um, because of what, what we've seen. But I just think this is, this is a big, big test for them. Um, and what we've seen from Newcastle... They've won five in a row. You know, they had a hard-fought win at Brentford. The, the two penalties actually completely bloat the Brentford XG as well. Um, so they, they actually only conceded 0.84 non-penalty expected goals against, which is a decent figure. Obviously, you know, one of the penalties was a complete stonewaller, so you can't just write that off. The other one was questionable. Um, but yeah, they, they've they've been really, really good. The attack is purring, and then they've been missing a couple of key players. It doesn't seem to have affected them. You know, Joe Linton's been playing on the left wing when Sir Maxim has been out in previous weeks. Josh Murphy's been playing really well as uh, as well when called upon. Obviously, Joe Willock's getting him on the goals. Um, and they've averaged 2.4 expected goals for per game. 
across that last five. So they are creating an abundance of chances. We might even see a switch in formation now that they're the two wingers down. They might go with Isak and Wilson, like they did for a bit of last week's uh, victory over Brentford. Um, so yeah, if I was to have a lean, it would be Newcastle. But I think the betting here in this match is both teams to score, uh, which is at minus one twenty. It's a very appealing price to me. Um, that Villa, despite playing relegation candidates across the last seven matches and keeping five clean sheets, they've actually conceded 1.3 expected goals against per game. So they should have conceded closer to nine goals as opposed to the two that they have. Um, so they are conceding chances. They, they're creating as well, and I think they will create at home. They've they scored you know, matches uh, against Arsenal, obviously, a couple. They scored at City. Um, yeah, and Newcastle, both teams scoring four of the last five with three of those away from home. So, really intriguing game. I think we're going to see quite a lot of goals. I think it's going to be high scoring, um, but I would be leaning towards Newcastle winning. Wow. Both teams to score I, looks the bet, though, for me. But See, I was leaning to the under um, because I do think it's going to be a close game. I... I... Look, I rate Unai Emery. I think he's a brilliant manager, and I think that there's time to adjust for Aston Villa ahead of playing a, a top team like Newcastle. And I do think that there'll be a response from, from Aston Villa. These two teams typically play, play to the under. Villa's been playing a lot more tight when it comes to their football as well. Not conceding those cheap goals that they conceded on a regular basis at the start of the season. They've been very, very competitive. It's one of these things where you look at the fixture list and you say, this might be a little bit too much for Newcastle. And back-to-back-to-back weeks, well, first of all, they played United at home, a, a difficult fixture. They were riding high, took that into- It wasn't you know, difficult, what, was it? No, but on, on paper it was. <laughs> it was a statement victory for them. They bounce back, they're, they're flying, they're away at West Ham. Then they're away at Brentford. This is their third consecutive away game. I just well, typically when this happens in that third away match, you know, th- third game in a row going away from home, you lose a little bit of that that energy. That I, whatever it is, it just seems like the performance regresses to a certain degree. That's why I like Aston Villa on the handicap here. I can see this game ending in a draw. It would be a half win if it ends up in a draw at plus point two five. And it's at a good number, plus 109. So uh, plus money, Villa, uh, a little bit too much of an underdog for my liking, playing at home against Newcastle. I'm okay with that. And I wouldn't be surprised if this game ended in a draw. Okay. I, I, I'm, uh, not sure what, I'm not sure what your data says on it, but like, you know, three consecutive away games. It's very rare. It doesn't happen very often. And I think this is a trickier one than advertised for Newcastle this weekend. Um, yeah, potentially, but I would I'd probably say Brentford away is a tougher tougher game than Villa away. Um and you know, they came away with a good three points there. They've had a week rest as well. Um so yeah, I, I I just have massive doubts about Villa. I think they're in a false position at the moment. And I think they're in a false position because obviously teams are completely falling apart around them, but they've also beaten rubbish teams. Um Newcastle aren't a rubbish team. This I think it could be a bit of a reality check for Villa. It could be it could be a springboard, it could be a reality check. It depends how they perform. But what we've what we've seen from Villa against the best teams in the league is that they are or they have been absolutely com- well, completely outplayed. Um, even under Emery. Um the, the two games back to back against City and, and, and Arsenal, like I said, they conceded 3.4 expected goals in both of those matches. Yeah. Um and created next to nothing. Um and Newcastle, for me, they're not quite at the level of Man City to just off the level of Arsenal. That's what the data suggests anyway. So, you know, if, if that kind of trend continues, it's a similar feeling to what I had when when they beat uh, Manchester United at home. I was very bullish about the chances in that game just because the data has them as a as a the third best team in the league. And I, and I just think that, yeah, this, is, this, this would be a huge... I, I'd see it as a scalp if Villa would beat Newcastle. I think it'd be a big upset. Obviously, the odds agree. And so why they're, they're, they're priced the way they are. And I just think that I, I don't want people to get too carried away just looking at the form book and going, oh, Villa, they've won six of the last seven. Have a look at the teams they've played because, you know, I'll read them out to you. They've played Everton, Crystal Palace before Hodgson, West Ham, Bournemouth, Chelsea, which was obviously Potter's final game, Leicester and then Forest. And, you know, three all three of those teams are in the bottom three right now. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I just I won't get carried away with the with the results. Performances in those matches actually haven't been massively impressive either. Um, I, I guess mainly away from home, but yeah, I, I just I, this is kind of a 
show me game for Aston Villa for me anyway if if they are to be genuine top top six contenders European contenders this is a come on prove it just another another quick mention on Newcastle they play Spurs next week so well, that's um, an easy three points isn't it <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll see about that not if the referees no the next come to the defense <laughs> of, of Spurs uh yeah we'll see we'll see what plays out this weekend as well should be a good one to get the weekend started um, moving on, it's Chelsea and Brighton. Chelsea, uh, they actually play at Real Madrid on Wednesday in the Champions League. We're recording this podcast before that game plays. Chelsea coming off a 1-0 loss at Wolves and are now 11th place. Super Frank Lampard, not so super, is he? At least as a manager, as a player, top-notch. As a manager, not so much. We should have a separate podcast. Who would you rather have managing your club, Lampard or Gerard? Yikes. Again, <laughs> pick them both in your 11, but as your manager, perhaps not the case. Uh, Chelsea haven't won in four. They haven't scored a goal back in, th- in, in, in going back three games now. Sound familiar to the Chelsea season? They've gone under two and a half and seven of nine. They haven't won in their last three games at home either. Diego Silva, Conte, and Mason Mount all traveled. To Spain for that fixture against Real Madrid and could be available this weekend, which I guess is some good news, despite all the clouds hovering over Stamford Bridge. Uh, Brighton, a controversial 2-1 loss at Spurs, a 0.5 XG to 1.67 in that game. It was their first loss away from home in eight. And Brighton, despite the setback, uh, still the third best expected goal differential away from home. They've gone over the two and a half goal total in five of seven, and they've been the first to score in six of eight. Head to head, Brighton smashed Chelsea. It was 4 1 in that game, 2.61 XG to 1.17, according to Info Goal. Brighton were up 3 0 at the half. Brighton haven't lost in four to Chelsea. No clean sheet for both or either side in their last three. They played to under the two and a half total in six of eight. Both teams to score has played in six of seven as well. So Chelsea, midweek fixture, right out of form. Brighton, the result didn't go their way last weekend, but still playing some really good football. What do you make of this tie? It's a complete rinse and repeat job for me. Um, from last week, you know, we were really unlucky. They you know, should have had a penalty when the game was one-one, which would have put the game, you know, in my opinion, beyond Spurs because I don't think Spurs have got that that about them to come back afterwards. Um, and yeah, they they created the better of the chances. They conceded very few. It was, it was a good performance, and any other day they would have won that match. Uh, yeah, ultimately Chelsea are uh, at this moment in time a worse team than Tottenham, which is seems pretty hard to do because Tottenham aren't very good either at the moment. Um, but yeah, they, they, it's just exactly the same bet again. I think Brighton are overpriced. Brighton plus naught on the handicap. Um, the lines moved from when I, I looked at it yesterday. Um, so it's what yeah. minus one hundred four. It's now minus one hundred one. So we're getting closer to even money for drawing a bet on Brighton, which just seems um, yeah a bit ridiculous to be fair. Because you know there's the I talk a lot about underlying numbers. The eye test. If you watch Brighton, you can tell that they are performing like a top four team. The underlying numbers completely back that up. So since the restart, they've actually been the second best team according to the underlying data. So only Manchester City have been better. Um, they've averaged a plus 0.95 expected goal difference per game. So they're nearly a full expected goal better than every opponent they've faced on average. Um, the second best attacking team, 2.2 expected goals for per game. Fourth best defensive team, 1.2 expected goals against per game. And the second most expected points per game at 1.9. So they are performing at ridiculously elite levels. Um, and you know they're the be- they're just the better team in this matchup, plain and simple. They're the better team. The data is is better. They've obviously had a midweek off, which has to be seen as a bonus. Um, Chelsea playing away at Real Madrid, they could get absolutely spanked and come into this game with the tail between the legs. Um, you, you know, even I probably would prefer if they were still in that tie going into Stamford Bridge. We might see some rotation, which would right. you know enhance my my uh, Brighton feeling even more. Um, so yeah, it, it's. It's really, for me, it's a it's a no brainer to take Brighton and the draw no bet. And I know it's hard to judge Lampard after one match, but there wasn't a lot to like about Chelsea's display at Wolves. I mean, it is it was the third worst attacking display since the restart. It's the worst attacking display in six matches. So before Potter got the sack, his team were 
you know, they generated two expected goals in four straight matches. So it was a massive downturn from an attacking process. And, and you know, anyone who's listened to this podcast recently will know that Wolves have been conceding a lot of good chances uh, and their expected goals output is poor. So it should have been a, a, a you know, a good, a good performance from Chelsea where we see them at least hit around 1.7 XG and they didn't. So hugely surprising for me because he's an attack-minded manager, but Chelsea's struggles just continue and I think we can take advantage. Uh, Potter's a better manager than Lampard and yeah. playing from an inferior position in this one. I, I'm, I, I'm actually surprised that the numbers shifted that much. Mm. You know, I, I didn't locked in Brighton, draw no bet, you know, on the handicap um, at minus one Oh five, I'll take minus one Oh one. I'm kind of curious to see if this shifts further out, depending on the way Wednesday night plays against Real Madrid. We'll see, but you're right. It's simple. Brighton's a better side. I was actually tempted to take Brighton with the outright victory, but right, right around even money. I mean, th- that's the play. That That's the way to go. And hopefully the footballing gods don't conspire um, back-to-back weeks in games against, quote-unquote, bigger clubs in London. Uh, not sure how much that goes into the goals being, uh, being made, but there we are. I love the way that Brighton play the most watchable side in the Premier League for me. Uh, it's been an awesome season and they're legit and we'll see if they can keep it together next season. And I do expect that European football, uh, is in their future come next season. Uh, we're going to shift things on to Sunday It's a full slate of games, seven games on Saturday, but some good games Sunday and Monday that we're going to deal with next. Uh, on Sunday, it's West Ham and Arsenal. West Ham coming off a 1-0 victory, a much-needed victory for David Moyes and company over Fulham. Yet, they only had 23% possession in that game and a dreadful 62% pass accuracy. What is going on there? And they had a 0.77 XG over the course of that game against you know, or a 1.44 XG to 0.77. Mitrovic is out for Fulham. There was just no punch to the Fulham attack. And West Ham just struggled to victory. That was coming off that 5-1 loss at home uh, to Newcastle. But before that game at home, uh, they were undefeated at, in five uh, playing at home. They're three, six, three and six overall playing at home. 19 goals scored, 19 against. They do play Ghent on Thursday in the conference league. So another game that won't be accounted for in terms of the way that we're breaking down this game, Arsenal two, two draw at Liverpool, a 4.4 XG for Liverpool was their most on the season. Arsenal struggled at the end. Aaron Ramsdale played great, by the way, a couple of big saves late on uh, and Arsenal have a six point lead with Manchester city having a game in hand on them atop the table. Uh, no losses in three without a clean sheet in four. Uh, Arsenal played to, over the two and a half total in seven of eight, both teams of scorers played in six of their last seven games. They've been the first to score in six of six and the first half winner in five of five. Head to head, Arsenal won this fixture, the reverse fixture, 3 1 after conceding first in that game. Arsenal have won three games in a row, haven't lost to West Ham in seven. Uh, these two sides have played to over the total in four of five. Both teams of score have played in four of five as well. And West Ham haven't picked up a clean sheet against Arsenal in their last seven meetings. All right. So Arsenal need to respond. Um, the, the pressure's on. Th- th- this West Ham side hasn't been very good despite picking up the victory last week. Is this an Arsenal bet for you this weekend? Um, No, it's not. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. I think, I think West Ham are stubborn. I I think they'll hang tough in the game. I know Newcastle completely blew them away um, not so long ago, but I think that that's probably going to prove to be an anomaly, a one-off. So I, I was tempted by the West Ham plus one on the handicap, which is what the line's set at. But I, I just like the look of the unders. Um, we're going back to the the unders, Chan. It's it's a big it's under. a big price. Under under. Plus 106 is huge um, for me, not only because this is West Ham and, you know, the unders landed in 60% of their matches since the restart, um, but also Arsenal, surprisingly, away from home against relegation candidates, unders landed in six of seven. Um, So they've, you know, the results have been very, I guess you could call them hard fought. So you look at the XG totals, Across those seven matches, they played Palace, Bournemouth, Leeds, Southampton, Wolves, Leicester and Everton. And they've averaged 1.3 expected goals for and 1.0 expected goals against per game. 
So they've really struggled against these teams according to the data. So whenever they've played away from home against a relegation threatened team, they've not created a lot of chances. Um, granted, they've kept the teams out, but I just thought it was really interesting looking at that, that data and, and just seeing that there potentially could be room for an Arsenal slip up against a, a way a team that we think that they should be easily because the, the data is not as strong as I expected. Um, and even if you look at the actual goals totals, 1.4 ex- uh, goals per game is what they're averaging in those seven matches. Three goals against, uh, 0.3 goals against per game. So that in total, their matches away at bottom uh, relegation threatened teams have seen an average of uh, 1.7 goals per game, which would obviously see the unders land. Um, so yeah, I, I was quite happy to see that we're getting a plus money for the unders um, and West Ham. Five of their seven home matches since the World Cup have, have gone under two and a half as well. So I, I can see this being a, a little bit of a, a tight contest, nervy contest from an Arsenal perspective. And yeah, I'm I'm happy to take a, a stance on the unders. I don't I do not trust West Ham at all, especially against good teams. I mean, they used to be a difficult team to play against. It's just not the case anymore. They lost 2-0 at home to Brighton, 2-0 at home to City. Smash five one uh, to to Newcastle. Like they've lost to good teams quite convincing convincingly without much of a fight this season. This was West Ham last year, sure, uh, of course. Uh, and unders uh, West Ham on the handicap. I'm fine with that. Arsenal remain the best away side in the Premier League. All the data suggests it. I mean, you could, of course, Manchester City's been being great, but the most points, what, what are they, 11-2-2? Two and two. They went to Anfield, went toe-to-toe, should have come away with something. Liverpool's a great team playing at home, and I think that they understand the magnitude of a game like this, that they have to come out and win. And again, West Ham playing in the conference, I know it's just the conference league, but it's a Thursday night fixture in a competition that, you know, they want to survive, but this is what will kind of save their season if they go out and win a trophy this year. <laughs> that's, that's what about this game on Thursday matters to West Ham. Give me Arsenal all day on the handicap. Give me the full goal. I, I think they, they're going to win this game 2-0, uh, 3-1, something like that. Plus 102, I am absolutely fine with that. West Ham, I, I, I think they're decent at set pieces. They can maybe get a goal, but Arsenal pretty good at defending set pieces and their goalkeeper's in exceptional form right now. So give me Arsenal. And and look, I'm a guy that's been trying to fade Arsenal all season long. I just can't do it here. West Ham, I just don't trust them whatsoever. Uh, Give me Arsenal on the handicap in this game. So an undersplay in an Arsenal game. Sucks. Yeah. (laughs) Since you have root interest in my bank accounts, so <laughs> but uh, I, I I like I do like Arsenal this weekend. A little bit of a, a bounce back, a response to, to to playing in a very difficult spot last week. Anything else to add on this? Shall we move on? No, no, I can see why you've got a pro Arsenal um, angle. Again, I, I I'm with you. I don't fully trust West Ham, but what we can trust them is, or where we can trust them is that they don't create a lot of good chances. And generally, they're pretty tight at the back. You know, they've conceded just 1.4 expected goals against per game since the restart. That's a 14 match span where they perform like a, you know, a top eight team in terms of defensive process. So they're the kind of things I'm relying on um, for this unders bet to cash and just hope that they don't run themselves into the ground in Belgium. They were poor last week. I just, every time I watch this team play, I just say, yuck. It's not very good whatsoever. Uh, also on Sunday, Nottingham Forest and Manchester United. Forest struggling. A 2-0 loss at Aston Villa and just a 0.29 expected goal differential in that game. XG in that game. They're down to 18th. They're in the relegation zone. Uh, something that I predicted for months on end. It's finally come to be. Uh, 1-3-11 and 11 away from home now. It's just incredible. They have five goals scored and 36 conceded away from home. They're the worst away team in the Premier League, and it's not even close. And as of now, they haven't won a game in their last nine. But, and here's the big but, they still remain a decent enough side at home despite results not going their way. Five, six, and four overall at home. And 19 goals scored and 18 against. Just You cannot make a Nottingham Forest play when they're playing away from home. At home, a little bit of a different story. Here's another but, though. 
They did lose at home in the EFL Cup to Manchester United by a score of three to nil. They haven't picked up a clean sheet in nine. They played to the over and two and a half, over two and a half in five of their last seven, and both teams to score has played in five of six. Manchester United were recording this ahead of their Europa League tie uh, against Sevilla at home on Thursday, but they are coming off a two nil victory over Everton. Uh, in the Premier League, they had 21 shots in the first half. I can't believe they didn't score more. And a 3.67 XG overall. They've gone over the two and a half total of five or six. There is a but here again when it comes to Manchester United. Marcus Rashford is out. A significant loss. The Really, the, 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 the significant provider of goals for this United side who, without Marcus Rashford, really struggled to find the back of the net. Here's another but. Casemiro back in the side. He's back from suspension. And Christian Eriksen returned last weekend from injury to play in a cameo role. 6-2 and 6 away from home. And 20 points is just the sixth most in terms of away points in the Prem this season. Head-to-head, three wins for Manchester United this season against Nottingham Forest between league and cup play. A 3-0 victory has played twice. And United won the other match 2-0. Uh, United won eight in a row against Nottingham Forest. They haven't lost in nine. Forest hasn't come away with a clean sheet in 11, and they played to over the two and a half total in seven of eight. Do United keep on rolling against Nottingham Forest, despite not having Marcus Rashford this weekend? <clears throat> um, I, I think so. Um, I, I The price to back Man United just to win, it doesn't really get me going. No. Um, so I, I I thought I'd have a little bit more of a speculative play um, and take Ooh. Man United to win to nil at plus one ninety. Uh, we landed a win to nil there with West Ham a few weeks ago, and I just look at the the data on Nottingham Forest, particularly in attack, and just think that this I, I find it hard to see where they're going to score really. Um, and then it's just a case of can Man United grab one and. You know Rashford is out, but Martial's back. I know he, he you know, he looked he looked fairly sharp when he came on. Um, it was against Anfield uh, against Liverpool, little cameo. Um, I think getting a few minutes under his belt is going to really help him. And obviously Sancho is going to get a run in the team, which I think, you know, he's not really shown much promise since he was reintegrated. But I think having game time and playing regularly should bring um, the best out of him, or at least give him the chance to show what he's capable of. So I think there's enough firepower there. Um, and yeah, Forest is just on a big time slide. I mean, the winless in, in nine, they've lost six. Across those nine matches, they've generated 0.74 non penalty expected goals for per game uh, and allowed 1.9. So they, they're performing like a, a relegation side. Um, the last five home matches, they've generated the same in terms of attacking process 0.74 expected goals per game. So they've got massive issues. And, and after a brief wobble by Man United, absolutely smashed by Newcastle um, and and Liverpool. They, they've won back-to-back. I mean, the Brentford win for me was impressive, um, as was the Everton one, but just for different reasons. Obviously, the Brentford was more about control and keeping tight and really trying to get that clean sheet. Um, and the Everton one was, they just created an abundance of chances, which, you know, we kind of expected, given that it was Everton and what they've shown particularly away from home. But, um, yeah, they, that, that was a a big win in terms of the number of chances they created that you mentioned. They could have been out of sight at half time. Um, and they won both those to nil, which, you know, yeah. is I, I'm not going from the short termism, but the Manchester United to win to nil again against arguably one of the worst, if not the worst, attacking team in the league looks slightly overpriced. And there's a little bit more stock to this. So they've kept um the, yeah, they've kept five clean sheets in the last seven league matches have Man United. So it's not just been recently two matches. They've won uh, one to nil in four of those and six matches away at relegation candidates so far this season. Uh, they've won to nil on four occasions. So they won two nil at Leeds, won one nil at Wolves, one nil at Southampton and one nil at, uh, at Leicester. So I can see a similar kind of result, a very controlled victory. And I think the, you know, the fact that Casemiro is going to be back only adds uh, confidence yeah. to my play that, that United are going to keep a clean sheet. Um, so, yeah, that, that was, for me, just having a little small play on that at a big price to, um, yeah, cheer, something to cheer on on Sunday afternoon. Right. Uh, Luke Shaw remains a question mark as well, likely out this weekend. Malassi has been a good defensive uh, left back for this side, so there isn't really a dip there as well. W- what's that number at, Jake? Win to nil? What are Plus you getting 190. Plus 190. See, that's... 
I think you might have a better play than me on this one. I already locked in similar train of thought, but I like the unders in this game under two and a half at plus at plus one Oh nine. I can see it being a two nil one nil grinded out game that, you know, Europa league football on Thursday, like, look like players like Anthony and Sancho and Wagcourt. I, I think they're, they're, they're fine. They're just not prolific in finding the back of the net. They're just struggling to, to, to find that final product as well. But overall, in the balance of it, I think that you said it. United have been playing a controlled brand of football. And I have great faith that they can go here and come away with the result. It might it might not be um, the most watchable game of the weekend. It might not be, you know, a free-flowing, uh, attacking football. But I think that United's pragmatic nature at times is what served them well. And I just can't see Forrest coming away with anything in this game yet again. Sorry, Forrest supporters. Uh, give me the unders in this game. I think United will grind out a, a victory. 1-0, 2-0 makes a lot of sense to me this weekend. Um, shall we move on to our final match of our feature five? It's Monday night football, <clears throat> Leeds and Liverpool. Leeds United coming to this game got smashed 5 1 by Roy Hodgson and Crystal Palace. Incredible on pinnacle, Crystal Palace, in terms of the exact goal amount that they'd score last week, and it went up to four. And Crystal Palace played at plus. 3,900 if they scored four goals exactly. Well, they did one more than that and scored a fifth. Absolutely wild. A 3.34 XG to Roy Hodgson's side in that game. Uh, Now uh, Leeds United have gone win-loss, win-loss over their last four games. They haven't picked up a clean sheet in their last seven. Leeds has played under the two and a half goal total in their last five games. Both teams to score has played in their last five games as well, and they've been the first to concede in five of their last seven. You like that number five? Well, they're five, five, and five at Ellen Road over the course of this season. Liverpool were great in their 2-2 draw with Arsenal. 4.4 was their highest XG in a game this season, according to InfoGoal. Back-to-back draws after putting up just a 0.25 XG at Chelsea. And no wins in five, despite that really good performance uh, uh, on the weekend, still looking to get in the win column, back in the win column. Uh, no wins in five away from home in all competitions as well for Liverpool. And 10 teams have more Premier League points away from home than Liverpool on this season, which is just absolutely wild. Just 13 points in 15 away matches in the Premier League for Liverpool and just three wins overall. 14 and 24 goals scored to goals conceded on the season. It's just wild. They're the fourth worst team in the Premier League in expected goals against um, with 30.1. That's just a wild number. However, this team is as healthy as they've been all season. Luis Diaz, he's on the verge of returning. Um, and this has been virtually the healthiest that this squad has been all season long. Uh, Liverpool uh, were winless in, or Leeds United, I should say, were winless in eight when they beat Liverpool. It was a shock victory, 2-1 at Anfield under Jesse Marsh. Leeds United won at Anfield this year. Just incredible to think all the way back to that time. Leeds hasn't come away with a clean sheet in their last 17 games against Liverpool. They played over the two and a half total in four of five. Liverpool have been the first to score in five of six, and Liverpool have been the first half winner in four of five. Um, I'm expecting goals in this game. What about you, Jake? Exactly the same, yeah. The uh, the line at over three, uh, minus 101, that's that's my bet. Uh, Leeds have gone goal crazy recently. 24 goals in the last five matches, 4.8 per game. Um, Defence has been the reason, really, as to why they've been um, so involved in high-scoring matches. They've shipped an average of 2.6 expected goals against per game in that, ma- in, in that run, only against a really poor Forest side that we've just discussed. Did they look okay defensively? Um, and yeah, you've got Liverpool, who've been simply woeful on the road, as you said, a completely different team when they're playing at Anfield. They've allowed over two expected goals against per away game, which is staggeringly high. Um, it's the third worst defensive process when travelling in the entire division from a per game basis. But they do create enough when travelling. They're 1.7 expected goals for per game. So their their away matches are averaging 3.73 expected goals in total on a per game basis. So yeah, in theory, this has got all the recipe for 
um, all the ingredients to be a really, really high scoring contest. I just hope we don't jinx it. Yeah. Uh, same thing over three at minus one Oh one Liverpool really poor defensively away from home. Uh, Leeds United, they, they have difference makers in attack. It's just at the back, just the schoolboy errors. It's just the way that it plays out. It's absolutely shocking for a team playing at this level. I, I'm expecting nothing but goals in this game. And we'll see. I, I'm not sure what the result will be and who will end up coming out on top, but th- th- there's certainly plenty of goals in this game. And over three at just about even money um, makes a whole lot of sense for me. Uh, let's switch on to rapid fire. Uh, four of the five games I have a play for, and I think I'm going to manage to be able to come through with five for five here. We'll make it a slate with every game I have a play for this week. How about you? Are you confident? Can you go 10 for 10? No, no. I've got two no uh, bets down. Okay. Okay. So I've, got, I've got eight in total out of the 10 matches and three remaining for quick fire. Well, what about Southampton and Crystal Palace? Roy Hodgson, the fountain of youth. Or maybe we just need to be able to respect experience like Hodgson's brought to the table. He completely turned around the state of affairs at Crystal Palace. Do you have a play for this game? Yes, I am taking Palace on the handicap. Plus no, uh, minus 112. They're starting to play um, more like what we saw from them last season, which was ultimately a top half team. It, looking at the fixture list, you can kind of understand, you, can't, well, you could expect this kind of turnaround because they've had a very tough run of fixtures to the end of Patrick Vieira's reign. And obviously, since Roy Hodgson's come in, his two matches in charge, he's faced two relegation candidates. So, um, yeah, Uncle Roy's got Palace vibe in, is what I've written down here. Two wins. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can hear Uncle good. Roy saying that too. I really you have know. my side vibing <laughs> right now. <laughs> exactly. That's all I'm missing from his post-match interviews. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the performances have been excellent. Like they're creating a ridiculous amount of chances. 2.8 XG against Leicester, 3.3 against Leeds. Um, and yeah, Southampton look completely bereft of ideas at the moment. Uh, well beaten by City. Since Sellers took charge, they've averaged 0.9 expected goals for per game. Um, which is really, really poor when they've allowed nearly two expected goals against per game. So they are looking um, like the worst team in the league, From a, uh, if we're being realistic. Um, if Palace continue to play in the same manner, they will have no issues whatsoever getting a result at St Mary's. And um, yeah, it, minus 112 Palace on, on the handicap. Um, I wouldn't put anyone off back in Palace just to win the game either at plus 169. Well, I have a little bit of a different play here. Both teams to score at minus 103. Neither can keep a clean sheet. <laughs> so they haven't had a clean sheet in their last four. Palace hasn't had a clean sheet in their last six. And head-to-head, both teams to score has played in four or five and over the two and a half goal total in four or five as well. There's been goals in this fixture. And I think that both teams can score in this game as well. And th- this is a big one for Southampton. I think that there is a path to survival. I, I I don't, it's bleak. It's not looking great, but with Leicester city and Nottingham forest playing back the way down, they just need to catch one other team for me. I think that, you know, I, and look, I, I think that there's Southampton are likely to go down, but it, they win this game. I, I think they'll feel a little bit more brighter about there's about the way that things could play out here over the final weeks of the season. So it's a big one for Southampton playing at home. This is a game where they need to come away with points. So both teams to score at minus 103. Everton and Fulham, they played to a goalless draw last time. I'm expecting the same. It's it's very rare that I bet on draws. I like a draw in this game at plus 248. This game is draw written all over it. Fulham, no Mitrovic. Their attack looks a little stagnant. Playing at a Daichi inside, at Goodison Park. And with Ellis Sims leading, I just... Everton, they can they can play and play and play. If a goal's not coming from a set piece, where's it coming from? So I think that the draw is the salient play in this game. And I think it's, it's is decent value at plus 248, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take Everton to win <clears throat> at plus 111. Um, they are a little bit like their Liverpoolian rivals, um, Jacqu- Jekyll and Hyde, in terms of home and away. So at home, they're posting a, an expected goal difference per game of plus 0.36. Um, again, under Sean Dyche, that, that despite hosting four of the top nine um, in their five home matches and three of the current top six, uh, away from home, it's at minus 0.9 expected goal difference per game. So they are completely different uh, proposition when, when playing hosts. 
Um, they're averaging nearly 1.7 expected goals for per game at Goodison. Uh, a re- returned a record of three one on one. I think it's a huge opportunity for them to get a win because Fulham have they drop like a stone. They look disinterested. They look like they're just um, cruising towards the end of the season. No, Mitrovic is a huge issue. Um, as I've said for a while now, the process all season has been around the 14th, 15th best in the league, and they're just regress regress into that kind of level. Winless in five, expected goals to, uh, averages in that time and 0.97, two expected goals against per game. So they are conceding a hell of a lot of chances. They're performing at a relegation level from a, an underlying data perspective. Um, and they rank as the fourth worst away team overall this season, allowing the second most expected goals against per away game. So mm. um, in, ironically, only Everton... They've got a worse defensive process when travelling than Fulham. Um, Liverpool third in that list. So, yeah, luckily for Everton, they're at home this week and I think they will get a win. All right. Uh, by the way, Marco Silva will have his boys ready to play at Everton. Come on. Like, this is a game that he can sharpen those knives a little bit, uh, play with a little bit more cutting edge. I, I just don't think that there's a, a, a lot in this. Um, Daesh has sledgehammers, so. not knives. So but, I'll take Daesh. <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, sledgehammers as feet don't really work when there's no touch in front of goal. <laughs> Who's going to score? If it's not James Tarkowski on a free on a set piece. What like just watching this team play play attacking football? I know they're generating chances, but there's simply no finish there. So could be another goalless draw. Who knows? Um, this was one of the two games where I kind of wanted to stay away from, but I just can't. Uh, Spurs and Bournemouth. Somehow Spurs, two wins and two draws in their last four in the Premier League. How does that happen? Um, do you have a bet for this game? No, this is one of the no-bet games. Um, if, I, if I was to have a lean, it would be Bournemouth on the handicap. Um, I think Bournemouth have shown enough recently to suggest that they can cause a bit of an upset and get a result. And Spurs continue to perform at, at really disappointing levels. So that would be my lean, but um, not confident enough to pull the trigger. Yeah, this is this is my ten out of ten. This is my tenth favorite bet of the weekend. <laughs> as ridiculous as that sounds, uh, give me the overs uh, over two point seven five at minus one twelve. Bournemouth had the worst expected goals against in the Premier League according to Info Goal in the season. They're considering thirty eight goals away from home. That for Harry Kane, like he's salivating. Say what you will about the Spurs side. I mean, Harry Kane bullies teams like this that are just poor defend, uh, poor in defending. So I, I think that Spurs can score this game. And by the way, they played to a 3-2 when these two teams met earlier this season. So I, I like the over at, at, at minus 112. Uh, the opposite of that, Wolves and Brentford this weekend. Uh, do, do you have a bet for this game? I don't know. This is my second no-bet game. Um Again, if I was to have a lean, it would be sided with the away side. Um, yeah. and they look a big price, Brentford at plus 193. Um, if you want to take them on the draw, no bet, plus 107. But yeah, I, I've Brentford away from home are always a little bit iffy for me. It's, it's not uh, consistent enough in terms of the level of performance. So I'm more than happy to leave this one alone. Yeah, the, the total doesn't do anything for me where it sits right now. But I think there's value in the Brentford draw no bet at plus 107. Plus number, if it's a draw, you get your money back. It ended 1-1 their previous game this season. Uh, Brentford's due. I, I don't I don't know if you're one of those people that put stake in that, but they haven't won or had a clean sheet in their last four. This The, the football that they played, is, it's been okay, though. It, it, they just haven't been rewarded for their efforts. So perhaps it's this weekend against a severely limited Wolves side. That's the best compliment I can pay them. Uh, they're just severely limited. So I'll go with the better side at a plus number with the insurance that uh, that a draw gets you your money back. And the final match of the weekend, it again, kind of feels like last week. You know, City, Southampton, the most kind of lopsided potential fixture of the weekend. This time it's Manchester City at home against Leicester City. Uh, what do you make of this? Because... Uh, Leicester City, if you like them to win, plus 1304, minus 529 for a Manchester City victory straight up. Yeah, City minus 145 to score three or more, which is pretty ridiculous. I mean, I wouldn't put anyone off backing it. I think that they could have a a bit of a party at the Etihad, but 
especially given the the state of play in the Champions League and how comfortable of a lead they have. Um, but yeah, I just thought at the prices, I, I'm chancing both teams to score, which was at minus 102. So it's nearly even money. Um, it's not a very confident place. So it's probably it's probably my least confident uh, bet of the week. But, you know, they, they've actually, City have conceded in nine of 14 home matches this season in the league. Um and, you know, they could rotate. They could take their eye off the ball uh, if they race into a 3-0 lead and unless they get a consolation, something like that, because this is obviously, this is the meat in the sandwich of Bayern, Bayern Munich sandwich. Um, and Leicester, away from home, are actually a much better attacking team than when playing at home. So they're away, they average 1.36 expected goals for per game, which actually ranks as the eighth best away attacking process in the league. And, and at home, it's less than one expected goal per game, which is the worst. So a huge difference. They prefer to play on the road. It's probably a style thing because they can play more on the counter-attack. Um, but they have scored in 12 of 15 away matches this season, which includes scoring twice at Arsenal and twice at Tottenham. They scored at Anfield and they really should have scored at Old Trafford in that first half an hour. They were excellent. So, um, you know, I, I just thought both teams to score looked a, a little bit overpriced to me. Uh, do you play in this one? Dog's breakfast. I just, uh, Leicester City, no wins in nine. City have won nine games in a row. City haven't lost in 13. Leicester City haven't had a clean sheet in 11. By the way, they, they did play, and it, I, I bet the overs for that game earlier this season, City beat Leicester City 1-0. I think the same thing or a very similar thing plays out here with a more lopsided total. Manchester City to win to nil at plus 101. A plus number. Oh, Leicester City, like, there's... I, I like the bet that they won't score in this game. And if they don't score, and City are, you know, overwhelming favorites to win this game, and you're getting, a, you know, just about even money on this, I, that's a number I can, I just can't turn down. Leicester City, I just not very good. Pep is going to drive it home that the Premier League is still theirs to, theirs to be taken. And I think they're going to be sharp this weekend. They're excellent against Bayern Munich. Outstanding in the Champions League on Tuesday. Uh, that's a way to roll over to the weekend. Another soft opponent. They just smashed out at Southampton last weekend. And, and you're right. Leicester City has scored in, in the majority of their away matches. But they didn't score at Southampton. They haven't scored against some pathetic teams as well. So th there's there's no assurances there. I think they're in some real trouble. And City are going to come away with an emphatic victory this weekend. So there's the board for this weekend. Anything else to add on that, Jake? Um, not really. If I was more confident about the both teams to score, I would have made that a head-to-head. -head, but um, I'm not. So we'll leave that alone for now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Coward. You're a coward. No. <laughs> I can't call you that. Um, yeah, I overstepped. Perhaps I forced the, a couple bets here at the end uh, to, to fill out the board. But I'm feeling very confident. Like, none of them... None of them I was very um I was shying away from this weekend. I I feel like it's a it's a it's a friendly board this weekend. So just like Roy Hodgson, good vibes all around um in terms of the <laughs> the, the uh, EPL Insights podcast this weekend. Uh you can follow along with Jake on Twitter at Jake Oz for his wonderful betting content. Myself at Gareth Wheeler, odds were correct at the time of recording and please gamble responsibly and within your means uh good stuff this week we'll do it all again next weekend as well jake as we're coming down to the wire um the run in here at the end of the season and cannot wait to see how this plays out on behalf of jake i am wheels this has been epl insights with data provided by infogol